just structure your data in a way, structure your data and your dashboards in a way to inform all your decisions and such that all of the decisions you make in pricing could be data driven. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal to stand in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts, cost 15 times the price. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the helpful relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving. Today, our guest, returning guest, is Wendy Johnson. Here are three things you want to know about Wendy before we start. She started out as an M&A consultant at Accenture, which is kind of interesting given what we're going to talk about today. Uh, she was our guest on episode 84, where we discussed what it was like to be a pricing executive. I highly recommend you go back and listen to that one. And she moved into pricing at IBM about 10 years ago and hasn't looked back. Uh, she's currently VP of pricing at PagerDuty. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you, Mark. I'm excited to be back. All right. Well, so I normally start out with how did you get into pricing, but everybody can hear that in episode 84 if they want to go back and listen. So let's today talk about consultants. That's what we said we were going to talk about. And, and at one point in time, you were a consultant. So this is kind of interesting uh, for a big company. First off, tell me why this is top of mind for you right now, and then we'll try to we'll try to put that in perspective. This is actually top of mind because I've been having conversations um, related to my new role at PagerDuty about where to use um, how to use our talent or how to structure our talent, and the, the topic of consultants has come up as it always does. You know, where is it appropriate to use that type of um, talent and those type of resources versus hiring and onboarding. Well, well, I love the fact that you framed that answer as the question to the next question. Where do you choose or what have you learned? Right? Where does it make sense to use consultants as opposed to hiring people? Right. Well, you know what? Given my experience um, using consultants in the past, and we've had some, I've had some hits and some misses. I found that um, the best way to use consultants and the best way to enter into those relationships is just to, is to have a structured engagement with a very finite piece of work or finite task. Um, I think a lot of times the, um, the project is too broad and you end up when that engagement ends not being left with enough to actually use the work they've done. Like for example, hiring a consultant to do packaging and pricing. Like you think you have a packaging or pricing challenge in the market, you need to make some adjustments. Consultants come in and they do that analysis for you and you know, good or bad um, piece of work, make some recommendations on your pricing. The engagement ends what happens the next quarter, right? And 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 your book, your book, you touch on this. And when price, um, um, when keep keep grow, right? Yeah. You touch on you in the beginning. You need to tweak a lot, right? You, it's not a, it's not a, you know, a static pricing isn't an aesthetic activity, right? It, it is never static. That's the right. thing. And so we're constantly adjusting. Um, I, you know, just like you, I've had experiences with consultants. I've never been one, uh, but I really, um, you know, I see pros and cons with consultants all the time. And one of the biggest cons I see is the implementation piece. So at the end of whatever the engagement is, they give you a gorgeous report. It's got phenomenal uh, analytics and results and recommendations. Mm -hmm. and, and now it's up to you. You gotta go figure out, are you gonna implement this? How do you implement this? It's really hard. It is really hard, especially if the people in the organization change after they leave. It's, that's happened before, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Do the implementation, well, everybody signs up and people change, right? Yeah, and, and so let's talk about, um, and by the way, I don't know the answers to these questions. We're just gonna have a conversation. Mm -hmm. How do we 
engage a consultant to get us really good ideas? And then how do we get that into implementation? How do we make it so that that's valuable to our company? I think um, we have to be careful or thoughtful when we engage the consultant, not only thinking about the piece of work that they want us to deliver, but including in the engagement, what that um, what it's going to look like after they leave, like what tools are they leaving for us to use to reassess right. Um, what, and what are their recommendations on their cadence or maybe we make a we have a relationship where they come back, you know, it, I, I just think everybody needs to be thoughtful about what that end looks like or. Yeah, I think it's easy, yeah. you know, for, forget the consultant for just a second. Mm -hmm. I think it's really easy for us as a company or even an executive to say, here's a brilliant idea, let's go do that. Mm -hmm. and, and we forget that we're touching 10 different departments, 30 different people. We're trying to get mm -hmm. people to change the way they behave every day. This is, it's tough to do this job. It is so, tough. It is tough. It is tough. So what, have you, have you engaged consultants to help you do the training? to help you convince all the other departments around that we have to go change what we do? Actually, yes. And I think consultants are very valuable in that particular area, that change management, because they're seen as objective, right? And um, I think the conversations are healthier when um, the recipients, it, it's not in all internal, right? And there's some objective feedback entering into those conversations. Yeah, it's interesting. I never do consulting. I've never been a consultant and I still mm -hmm. don't do consult. What I call consulting, I do a lot of advising of companies and, and coaching of individuals. And, uh, and one of my clients right now said that he wanted me to do the training. And the reason was because he thought that people would listen to me more than they would listen to him. And, uh, and I just found that really interesting. Um, probably truthful, but really interesting. No, no, it is. I, I think it is truthful. And just, just hearing another voice <laughs> yeah. is helpful too, versus the one you're hearing on your, on your, your meetings every week. I think that's, that helps. That's helpful, especially if it's um, a sizable transformation. Right? Yeah. So, so let's start at the beginning. How do you hire a consultant? Why do you hire a consultant? Is there, in, in your experience, have you seen uh, what, what was the impetus that says we got to go hire a new consultant? There's been a scenario where we knew we just did not have enough feet on the ground doing a huge transformation. You don't necessarily want to hire a lot of talent because you know that that, that capacity need is temporary, right? So then you figure out how to fill that temporarily with, um, with consultants or there's a specific skill set that you knew, and that's temporary as well. Um, you know you're not gonna need that ongoing. So I think those, those are good scenarios. I also think organizations, specifically for pricing, who are just entering their pricing journey, um, it's probably healthy to hire a consultant, get feedback on what they should be doing before they invest a lot in the wrong place. Yeah, I've certainly seen consultants do audits that I thought were very valuable mm -hmm. uh, because it, it helps a company understand here are some places you could go. Here's where the low hanging fruit is. Let's go. Let's go get that first. So I think that's um, hugely powerful. And, and then I also am always amazed at the times that I've had consultants working with me is usually there's one or two super smart, super experienced people involved in the engagement. And then they throw 10 or 20 uh, people straight out of college that are crunching numbers and doing all the work. And you're like, whoa, we need people to do the work. This is pretty awesome. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> that was me in the beginning of my career. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, that was, I mean, I mean, these, they work these guys hard. So yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> so it may be expensive, but boy, you get, uh, you get something out of it. So you certainly do. And I, you know, I would say, especially the larger, like the big, is it still big five? I forget what number they are now. I, Those big five, they hire excellent talent at that level. They can attract really good talent and they, they, they just hire very well at that level, level I find. Right. 
Well, they, they pay extremely well. They, uh, they do a fantastic job at recruiting. And, and by the way, I think it's a really fun job in the sense that you're only on a, a specific engagement for three to six months, and then you get to go yeah. do something else. And so you're exposed to so many different opportunities and so many different learning lessons. So, I mean, I think it's a wonderful job if you're willing to work hard straight out of school. Um, I've never been willing to work hard, so that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's talk about um, who inside a company should be engaged with the consult in, in the world of pricing, right? Who inside our company should we get involved with the consultants? I definitely think the pricing leader, and going back to what I said about, um, you know, companies early on in their pricing um, journey, I do think it, it's good to hire a consultant, like you said, to do an audit or just give some advice on what the next steps should be, maybe somewhat what an organization for that company could look like or some options. But I wouldn't do too much more with the consultant until you hire a pricing leader. Because it's, and this has come from my experience, a lot of times it's difficult for that leader to enter that organization and try to pick up work that a consultant has left behind and maybe have a different perspective on what should have been done. So it might end up not being the best value if you're redoing or throwing stuff away. Yeah, so what I just heard you say is hire your pricing leader before you hire your consultants. And, and that makes sense in that, look, the consultant's gonna leave someday. Right. You need someone there that understood that that took uh, took responsibility or ownership of this project, and they can see it through and help the company through. Uh, so I think that that makes a ton of sense. Right. Right. But right. And sure offer we... that continuity. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So so we get the pricing leader involved. Um, how often are other executives involved? I think it's good to. Um, established milestones so that you're getting buy-in along the way, depending on what those, um, of, depending of course on what that project is. Um, but yes, it's definitely, you definitely need to establish those milestones. So you're getting that, that buy-in along the way and you don't have to extend the engagement further, making it more <laughs> expensive. <laughs> yeah, and it probably has a lot to do with how big the project is. Right. Right. If we're transforming the company, the CEO probably needs to be involved. And, and if we're trying to change a price or find a price point on a product, probably not. Right, right. So, data, if you have internal data analysts, I like to have them engage a lot oh, yeah. throughout. So they can pick up, they, they, they can reuse whatever those tools are, right? And that analysis, then redo it again quarterly or annually. Yeah, so although we get our own data analysts to help with the consultant, Right, because they need to be able to find the right data and understand the right data. Um, our data analysts are also learning from the consultants. What's going True. on? Um, how are you doing your analytics? The consultants will ask questions that we didn't know the answers to, and now we get to go figure it out. And, and so we learn a ton as we do that. I, I think that's, uh, that's awesome. So how do, we, how do we know if a consultant succeeded? How do we know if this was a successful engagement or not? I think if we have... Um the answer and answer to our question at the end of the engagement. And then if we have a way to continue doing that work, we're not stuck with that because we know that an answer is not necessarily the right, or it might be right at that time, right. but the market changes, everything changes and we need to be able to change, but we need a plan for when they, leave. if we have a plan for when they leave, then I think we're good. So I think that's a reasonable answer. Um, I would love to know, did we actually implement it? Did we do something? That's, that's a good point. Did we do yeah. something? What was the impact? What was the impact? What, what was the ROI on this whole yep. <laughs> effort? And can we measure it? Yeah. So now I love consult. I, I have lots of friends who are consultants. I actually love them to death. I think they're awesome, smart, great people but I have a complaint or two about consultants. And so let me toss one out and, uh, and I wanna hear what you, 
if you've experienced it, what you do to not experience it. But what I've seen happen is consultants come in and I think they make really good short-term recommendations that hurt the company in the long-term. And that's because they get graded on the short-term response or the short-term results, and they never get blamed for the long-term results. So do you see that? And how do you try to prevent that? You know, I see that especially with price actions. Do we want to um, raise or lower a price? Um, and that that always falls in the bucket. <laughs> yes. Of what you described. Very easy to get great short-term results. Um, but the long-term, especially if later down the line, we're dealing with migrations or complexity that we've built into our system because of a new model or manual work that we're looking ahead on. The consultants are usually not around. <laughs> yes. At that time for that renewal cycle, right? Yeah. Um, for that base. And so have you seen a way to combat that? Did you just say, look, I don't believe you as a consultant. I don't want to do that. Do we, I mean, what do we what do we have to do to make sure we're not hurting our long term business? I think and that's why it's so important to have a pricing leader or somebody who really understands pricing. So they're they know the modeling work that needs to be done to make those long term estimates, right? So although we might not have the capacity to do the work ourselves, we do have somebody who can guide that work and ask the right questions. And you're not leaning entirely on your consultants for that guidance, right? Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever seen, uh, I, I've never seen this, but I love the idea. Have you ever seen somebody hiring a second consultant to implement what the first consultant recommended? I haven't seen that. I have not. I have seen, I have been seen an organization who gets stuck in a cycle of consultants. Like it, it's, it's really a matter of not fixing the real problem. You know, it's, I need a consultant for this project. And then there's a next follow on pro and there's always a project because the core work has not been done, you know? Yeah. There's something fundamental that we didn't get to. And so the, it feels like it's always broken. Yes, it's, it's always broken. There's always a fire drill. There's always a, like pricing shouldn't always be project work right? You should build a framework and there should be some consistent cadence and how you measure performance and tweak. You should be tweaking more than overhauling. Yeah. And so what I find mm -hmm. interesting when you say the word, it shouldn't be a project uh, work. Uh, at first, I wanted to disagree with you. In fact, I still might a little, mm -hmm. but, uh, but I absolutely agree. Pricing is a process. Right. And so we put it processes in place that we can just turn the crank and we do this over and over again and we set prices and we monitor and we change prices and we monitor and and so we have this process in place. And then when it's time to go tweak something yeah let's create a project right let's go do something to, to figure out how we're going to get better at what we do how we're going to tweak our process and we might implement a project to go tweak our process. But but I agree completely Pr pricing has to become a process for us if we're going to do it right. well. Right. No, I, I completely agree. I completely agree. Nice. Nice. Wendy, this has been fascinating and fun as always. I love talking to you, uh, but let's, let's ask the final question here. What's the one piece of pricing advice you're going to give our listeners that you think would have a big impact on their business? Oh, wow. You got me, Mark. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, I, you know, and this annoys probably a lot of the people I work with and <laughs> I'm so focused on data and just structure your data in a way, structure your data and your dashboards and to, in a way to inform all your decisions and so, such that all of the decisions you make in pricing could be data driven. 
it helps when it helps with engaging with all your stakeholders, including consultants. There's just a lot, a lot less churn in terms of disagreements uh, and a lot of back and forth when all of your decisions are data-driven. Because even if you don't agree with the final decision, it's so much easier to tweak if yeah. you have a good base of data. Yeah, I, I agree 100% that we need good data. We should be using good data. So I'll ask a follow-on question. Uh, what do you think are a few of the really interesting KPIs you're watching on your dashboard? The ones I, I, and this is very basic, that I like to watch is just unit prices, you know? Yeah. The average, of course, and what that range is. How wide is that range? Do we have any control over what our unit price? And of course, segmentation, segmentation, like just figure out what the segmentation is that's driving customer behavior because that unit price can be right on point for one segment and way off for another segment. And understanding the segments for your business, that uh, there's, there's so much opportunity in understanding the value that your product or service um, is for various segments of your business. So, so much opportunity there. So it's so funny. Maybe I'm too much of a geek, but as you're describing that, I'm picturing my dashboard that I'm about to go build now just because I, I want what you just said. And so my dashboard has a, a box plot of ASPs and I can choose the time frame that I want to see for the ASP box plot. And, uh, and then I can have a drop down for my market segment, which market segment am I looking at? And I can see how the box plots, oh my God, this is awesome. I want this. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Thanks. Wendy, thank you so much for your time today. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? LinkedIn is always the best way. Wendy Johnson on LinkedIn. Um, okay, we'll have your LinkedIn in the show notes because I'm pretty sure there's more than one Wendy Johnson. Um, probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Episode 147 is all done. Thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed this, would you please leave us a rating and a review? These are extremely valuable to us. And if you have any questions or comments about this podcast or pricing in general, feel free to email me, mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact.